part one section eight of the main woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one katahdin section eight the tops of mountains are among the unfinished parts of the globe whether it is a slight insult to the gods to climb and pry into their secrets and try their effect on our humanity only daring and insolent men perchance go there simple races as savages do not climb mountains their tops are sacred and mysterious tracks never visited by them pomola is always angry with those who climb to the summit of katahdin according to jackson who in his capacity of geological surveyor of the state has accurately measured it the altitude of katahdin is fifty three hundred feet or a little more than one mile above the level of the sea and he adds it is then evidently the highest point in the state of maine and it is the most abrupt granite mountain in new england the peculiarities of that spacious tableland on which i was standing as well as the remarkable semicircular precipice or basin on the eastern side were all concealed by the mist i had brought my whole pack to the top not knowing but i should have to make my descent to the river and possibly to the settled portion of the state alone and by some other route and wishing to have a complete outfit with me but at length fearing that my companions would be anxious to reach that river before night and knowing that the clouds might rest on the mountain for days i was compelled to descend occasionally as i came down the wind would blow me a vista open through which i could see the country eastward boundless forests and lakes and streams gleaming in the sun some of them emptying into the east branch there were also new mountains in sight in that direction now and then some small bird of the sparrow family would flit away before me unable to command its course like a fragment of the grey rock blown off by the wind i found my companions where i had left them on the side of the peak gathering the mountain cranberries which filled every crevice between the rocks together with blueberries which had a spicier flavour the higher up they grew but were not the less agreeable to our palates when the country is settled and roads are made these cranberries will perhaps become an article of commerce from this elevation just on the skirts of the clouds we could overlook the country west and south for a hundred miles there it was the state of maine which we had seen on the map but not much like that immeasurable forest for the sun to shine on that eastern stuff we hear of in massachusetts no clearing no house it did not look as if a solitary traveller had cut so much as a walking stick there countless lakes moosehead in the southwest forty miles long by ten wide like a gleaming silver platter at the end of the table chesuncook eighteen long by three wide without an island millinocket on the south with its hundred islands and a hundred others without a name and mountains also whose names for the most part are known only to the indians the forest looked like a firm grass sward and the effect of these lakes in its midst has been well compared by one who has since visited this same spot to that of a mirror broken into a thousand fragments and wildly scattered over the grass reflecting the full blaze of the sun it was a large farm for somebody when cleared according to the gazetteer which was printed before the boundary question was settled this single penobscot county in which we were was larger than the whole state of vermont with its fourteen counties and this was only a part of the wild lands of maine we are concerned now however about natural not political limits we were about eighty miles as the bird flies from bangor or one hundred and fifteen as we had ridden and walked and paddled we had to console ourselves with the reflection that this view was probably as good as that from the peak as far as it went and what were a mountain without its attendant clouds and mists like ourselves neither bailey nor jackson had obtained a clear view from the summit setting out on our return to the river still at an early hour in the day we decided to follow the course of the torrent which we supposed to be Murch Brook, as long as it would not lead us too far out of our way. We thus travelled about four miles in the very torrent itself, continually crossing and recrossing it, leaping from rock to rock, and jumping with the stream down falls of seven or eight feet, 
or sometimes sliding down on our backs in a thin sheet of water this ravine had been the scene of an extraordinary freshet in the spring apparently accompanied by a slide from the mountain it must have been filled with a stream of stones and water at least twenty feet above the present level of the torrent for a rod or two on either side of its channel the trees were barked and splintered up to their tops the birches bent over twisted and sometimes finely split like a stable broom some a foot in diameter snapped off and whole clumps of trees bent over with the weight of rocks piled on them in one place we noticed a rock two or three feet in diameter lodged nearly twenty feet high in the crotch of a tree for the whole four miles we saw but one rill emptying in and the volume of water did not seem to be increased from the first we travelled thus very rapidly with a downward impetus and grew remarkably expert at leaping from rock to rock for leap we must and leap we did whether there was any rock at the right distance or not it was a pleasant picture when the foremost turned about and looked up the winding ravine walled in with rocks and the green forest to see at intervals of a rod or two a red-shirted or green-jacketed mountaineer against the white torrent leaping down the channel with his pack on his back or pausing upon a convenient rock in the midst of the torrent to mend a rent in his clothes or unstrap the dipper at his belt to take a draught of the water at one place we were startled by seeing on a little sandy shelf by the side of the stream the fresh print of a man's foot and for a moment realized how robinson crusoe felt in a similar case but at last we remembered that we had struck this stream on our way up though we could not have told where and one had descended into the ravine for a drink the cool air above and the continual bathing of our bodies in mountain water alternate foot sits douche and plunge baths made this walk exceedingly refreshing and we had travelled only a mile or two after leaving the torrent before every thread of our clothes was as dry as usual owing perhaps to a peculiar quality in the atmosphere after leaving the torrent being in doubt about our course tom threw down his pack at the foot of the loftiest spruce tree at hand and shinned up the bare trunk some twenty feet and then climbed through the green tower lost to our sight until he held the topmost spray in his hand mccauslin in his younger days had marched through the wilderness with a body of troops under general somebody and with one other man did all the scouting and spying service the general's word was throw down the top of that tree and there was no tree in the main woods so high that it did not lose its top in such a case i have heard a story of two men being lost once in these woods nearer to the settlements than this who climbed the loftiest pine they could find some six feet in diameter at the ground from whose top they discovered a solitary clearing and its smoke when at this height some two hundred feet from the ground one of them became dizzy and fainted in his companion's arms and the latter had to accomplish the descent with him alternately fainting and reviving as best he could to tom we cried where away does the summit bear where the burnt lands the last he could only conjecture he descried however a little meadow and pond lying probably in our course which we concluded to steer for on reaching this secluded meadow we found fresh tracks of moose on the shore of the pond and the water was still unsettled as if they had fled before us a little farther in a dense thicket we seemed to be still on their trail it was a small meadow of a few acres on the mountain side concealed by the forest and perhaps never seen by a white man before where one would think that the moose might browse and bathe and rest in peace pursuing this course we soon reached the open land which went sloping down some miles toward the penobscot perhaps i most fully realized that this was primeval untamed and forever untamable nature or whatever else men call it while coming down this part of the mountain we were passing over burnt lands burnt by lightning perchance though they showed no recent marks of fire hardly so much as a charred stump but looked rather like a natural pasture for the moose and deer exceedingly wild and desolate with occasional strips of timber crossing them and low poplars springing up and patches of blueberries here and there i found myself traversing them familiarly like some pasture run to waste or partially reclaimed by man but when i reflected what man what brother or sister or kinsman of our race had made it and claimed it 
i expected the proprietor to rise up and dispute my passage it is difficult to conceive of a region uninhabited by man we habitually presume his presence and influence everywhere and yet we have not seen pure nature unless we have seen her thus vast and drear and inhuman though in the midst of cities nature was here something savage and awful though beautiful i looked with awe at the ground i trod on to see what the powers had made there the form and fashion and material of their work this was that earth of which we have heard made out of chaos and old night here was no man's garden but the unhandseled globe it was not lawn nor pasture nor mead nor woodland nor lea nor arable nor waste land it was the fresh and natural surface of the planet earth as it was made for ever and ever to be the dwelling of man we say so nature made it and man may use it if he can man was not to be associated with it it was matter vast terrific not his mother earth that we have heard of not for him to tread on or be buried in no it were being too familiar even to let his bones lie there the home this of necessity and fate there was clearly felt the presence of a force not bound to be kind to man it was a place for heathenism and superstitious rites to be inhabited by men nearer of kin to the rocks and to wild animals than we we walked over it with a certain awe stopping from time to time to pick the blueberries which grew there and had a smart and spicy taste perchance where our wild pines stand and leaves lie on their forest floor in concord there were once reapers and husbandmen planted grain but here not even the surface had been scarred by man but it was a specimen of what god saw fit to make this world what is it to be admitted to a museum to see a myriad of particular things compared with being shown some star's surface some hard matter in its home i stand in awe of my body this matter to which i am bound has become so strange to me i fear not spirits ghosts of which i am one that my body might but i fear bodies i tremble to meet them what is this titan that has possession of me talk of mysteries think of our life in nature daily to be shown matter to come in contact with it rocks trees wind on our cheeks the solid earth the actual world the common sense contact contact who are we where are we ere long we recognized some rocks and other features in the landscape which we had purposely impressed on our memories and quickening our pace by two o'clock we reached the bateau here we had expected to dine on trout but in this glaring sunlight they were slow to take the bait so we were compelled to make the most of the crumbs of our hard bread and our pork which were both nearly exhausted meanwhile we deliberated whether we should go up the river a mile farther to gibson's clearing on the sowadnehunk where there was a deserted log hut in order to get a half-inch auger to mend one of our spike poles with there were young spruce trees enough around us and we had a spare spike but nothing to make a hole with but as it was uncertain whether we should find any tools left there we patched up the broken pole as well as we could for the downward voyage in which there would be but little use for it moreover we were unwilling to lose any time in this expedition lest the wind should rise before we reached the larger lakes and detain us for a moderate wind produces quite a sea on these waters in which a bateau will not live for a moment and on one occasion mccausland had been delayed a week at the head of the north twin which is only four miles across we were nearly out of provisions and ill prepared in this respect for what might possibly prove a week's journey round by the shore fording innumerable streams and threading a trackless forest should any accident happen to our boat it was with regret that we turned our backs on chesuncook which mccausland had formerly logged on and the allagash lakes there were still longer rapids and portages above among the last the ripogenus portage which he described as the most difficult on the river and three miles long the whole length of the penobscot is two hundred and seventy-five miles and we are still nearly one hundred miles from its source hodge the assistant state geologist passed up this river in eighteen thirty seven and by a portage of only one mile and three quarters crossed over into the allagash and so went down that into the st john and up the matawaska to the grand portage across to the st lawrence 
his is the only account that i know of an expedition through to canada in this direction he thus describes his first sight of the latter river which to compare small things with great is like balboa's first sight of the pacific from the mountains of the isthmus of darien when we first came in sight of the st lawrence he says from the top of a high hill the view was most striking and much more interesting to me from having been shut up in the woods for the two previous months directly before us lay the broad river extending across nine or ten miles its surface broken by a few islands and reefs and two ships riding at anchor near the shore beyond extended ranges of uncultivated hills parallel with the river the sun was just going down behind them and gilding the whole scene with its parting rays about four o'clock the same afternoon we commenced our return voyage which would require but little if any poling in shooting rapids the boatmen use large and broad paddles instead of poles to guide the boat with though we glided so swiftly and often smoothly down where it had cost us no slight effort to get up our present voyage was attended with far more danger for if we once fairly struck one of the thousand rocks by which we were surrounded the boat would be swamped in an instant when a boat is swamped under these circumstances the boatmen commonly find no difficulty in keeping afloat at first for the current keeps both them and their cargo up for a long way down the stream and if they can swim they have only to work their way gradually to the shore the greatest danger is of being caught in an eddy behind some larger rock where the water rushes upstream faster than elsewhere it does down and being carried round and round under the surface till they are drowned mccausland pointed out some rocks which had been the scene of a fatal accident of this kind sometimes the body is not thrown out for several hours he himself had performed such a circuit once only his legs being visible to his companions but he was fortunately thrown out in season to recover his breath in shooting the rapids the boatman has this problem to solve to choose a circuitous and safe course amid a thousand sunken rocks scattered over a quarter or half a mile at the same time that he is moving steadily on at the rate of fifteen miles an hour stop he cannot the only question is where will he go the bowman chooses the course with all his eyes about him striking broad off with his paddle and drawing the boat by main force into her course the sternman faithfully follows the bow End of section eight recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine.